Hi, I'm Meg Groling, and I'm the author of First Fallen, the life of Colonel Elmer Ellsworth, the North's first Civil War hero. This is the man, but I'm sure you're asking yourself, as were the politicians in Washington, just who is Elmer Ellsworth? He hadn't been killed yet. And what is he doing in Washington, D.C.? Among the men who accompanied the president-elect on the inaugural special train trip from Springfield to the Capitol, Elmer Ellsworth, John Hay, and George Nicolay garnered a lot of attention, mainly due to their youth, their good looks, and their access to Lincoln. Hay and Nicolay were Lincoln's private secretaries, of course. But who is the short guy in the funny uniform? All the average Washingtonian knew about him was that he had been the leader of a band of self-styled zouaves out of Chicago, which had toured the Northeast the summer before. Renamed the U.S. Zouave Cadets, they became veritable rock stars during their 20-city tour, which had included New York, Boston, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, even uh, for President Buchanan on the lawn of the uh, White House in Washington. Newspapers had given them nothing but rave reviews and women had run down to the ships and the trains that carried them and handed them endless bouquets and romantic love letters. Ellsworth himself became, in John Hay's words, the most talked about man in the country. So obviously there's more to this story. In the late 1850s, the United States Army had just about 16,000 men in uniform, and most of them were serving in the far west. Neither the north nor the south was in any way militarily prepared for a war. Many local militia companies had become social clubs that walked together in parades or got dressed up in uniform to bury one another. But these volunteers were in no way ready to help the United States Army fight a real war. And this was a problem. Elmer Ellsworth had been some sort of soldier for most of his life, but had never served in the regular army. He had drilled militia groups in New York, Illinois, and Wisconsin, and had quite a good reputation as being a leader who could give a militia company the discipline necessary to compete at more, a more demanding level than the local patriotic parade on Washington's birthday. However, Ellsworth's skill at handling soldiers in a real war, one with bullets, was completely untested. No one was more aware of this than Ellsworth himself. The militia was his passion, but politics made plain that if there was a war, American militia, state militias, were going to have to be in the military vanguard until the regular army was fully recruited and trained for service. How this should be accomplished was Ellsworth's first concern. Ellsworth's prominence in Illinois militia circles brought him into contact with such Chicago power brokers as General R.K. Smith, General Simon Buckner, and Richard Yates. These men mentioned him to aspiring Republican presidential candidate Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was aware, even before he met Ellsworth, before he met Ellsworth that this young man was one to be watched. Rather than take his theories of national defense to the Illinois politicians, Ellsworth worked on his own to design and then perfect a form of military drill based on that of the Algerian forces in the Crimean War. He took the already formed Chicago Zouave cadets, renamed, re-equipped, and trained these cadets for about a year. The company soon won a regional competition against all other militia drill teams. At that point, the newly named United States Zouave Cadets began what John Hay referred to as their March du Triomphe. Hardly had they left Chicago when the murmur of applause began. The cadets, led by Ellsworth, went on a barnstorming tour of the Northeast in the summer of 1860. The regiment performed their stunning acrobatic actions and dazzling march sequences with weapons, including bayonets. They took the North state by state with their dynamic performances. As they left each town or city, 
new military companies sprang up behind them, eager to develop into prepared citizen militia groups. When they returned to Chicago, Ellsworth and his men were the 19th century equivalent of rock star performers. The tour had successfully raised the military consciousness of the Union. When Elmer Ellsworth met Abraham Lincoln, the proverbial die was cast. Later that uh, in that time, Lincoln had brought Willie and Tad to the fairgrounds in Springfield to see the second to the last Zouab performance. They liked and respected each other from the start, and Lincoln extended Ellsworth an invitation to come to Springfield to study law. Little studying got done as Ellsworth immediately began to assist in the campaigning for Lincoln's nomination and then the election to the presidency. There's an anecdote, um, which is true, um, of Ellsworth being in the... Um, the war room sort of at um, at Lincoln's headquarters and in the afternoon when everybody walked down to vote Ellsworth went with them and uh, Lincoln famously uh, tore off the uh, presidential voting and only voted down ballot and then they returned to uh, the Lincoln Herndon law office and uh, Lincoln watched election results coming in via telegraph and finally new york and pennsylvania uh sent their their numbers in and he realized that he was elected their after party which had been planned all along was um uh, planned by mary lincoln and it was not at a huge hotel in springfield but at a local a local ice cream parlor and Mrs. Lincoln had asked her friends to bring cookies and sandwiches. So everybody walked down to the ice cream parlor to celebrate. The reason that I mention this is that this is the last night Lincoln will ever just be a lawyer in Springfield. Um, something as humble as a, a little party for friends in an ice cream parlor is the, uh, the final note in that part of his life because when he wakes up the next morning he's the president-elect and uh, literally belongs to the rest of the nation now his life in springfield although he didn't know it at the time would uh, would never happen again so the day after lincoln's inauguration in washington march 5th 1861 lincoln had written a letter to secretary of war simon cameron the letter requested that Ellsworth be given a job as chief clerk in the War Department. And this would get Ellsworth's booted foot into the heavy oak door, where he would soon, he hoped, be appointed head of a newly created Bureau of Militias at the rank of Major. And the problem was that Major General Winfield Scott, who before the inauguration was already well aware of one assassination attempt that was to be made during Lincoln's journey to Washington, had determined to get Lincoln safely inaugurated. He rallied the entire city. He appointed Colonel Charles Stone to oversee coordinating Washington's local militias with the United States Army to keep the capital safe. Both Scott and Stone did their job. Lincoln was inaugurated, and General Scott considered that the position of Bureau of Militias was already filled by Colonel Charles Stone. You may remember uh, Charles Stone from Ball's Bluff. Lincoln and Ellsworth were simply embarrassed. They neither one had ever been in the in the real army, and uh, they just didn't quite know how things were done. It was only ignorance on their part. Ellsworth then agreed to accept another lesser job, the rank of lieutenant, but he continued to work with such persons as Thurlow Weed, Judge David Davis, and Major David Hunter, Captain John Pope, all of whom endorsed having a plan in place to weave the volunteer militias of the North into the U.S. Army quickly and professionally. Ellsworth had been at the White House every day since the Lincolns had moved in. Not only had he been to see the president and his friends John Hay and George Nicolay, who were living in the White House, Ellsworth was living at Willard's Hotel, 
but he also been to see Willie and Tad Lincoln, the president's young sons. Ellsworth was greatly loved by the Lincoln family and had been since he first met them. He was called by Mary Lincoln's cousin, Elizabeth Grimsley, a pet of the family. He played with Willie and Tad as if he was a child himself, and he was just about the only one other than um, Abraham himself who could control and calm Mary Lincoln when she got into one of her moods. Well, the boys had come down with measles, and by March 20th, so had Elmer Ellsworth. Initially, Elmer thought it might be smallpox, which had killed his younger brother the year before, and he, diva that he was, hysterically locked himself in his room at Willard's Hotel. He didn't tell anyone he was sick. Within a day or so, Hay and Nicolay had found him and were pounding on the door. Ellsworth was very sick for over three weeks, staying in his room until the first part of April. Measles at, at an adult age is even now a very serious illness, high fevers and periods of delirium, and it was rampant in both the Union and Confederate armies at the beginning of the war and killed many, and of course there were no vaccines. During one night of high fever, John Hay was sitting with Ellsworth, probably mopping his brow and trying to keep him comfortable, and they began to talk about the probability of losing Fort Sumter and more Southern secession. Hay quoted Ellsworth, I can only speak for myself. You know I have a great work to do, to which my life is pledged. Yet I could ask no better death than to fall next week before Sumter. You will find that patriotism is not dead, even if it sleeps. Well, Sumter fell, and the sleeping North awoke. By April 15th, Ellsworth, still weak from his bout with measles, resigned his lieutenant's commission and started for New York City, ready to respond to his friend Abraham Lincoln's call for 75,000 men. He went without orders, but he knew that Lincoln supported his actions as he had a letter of introduction from Lincoln to Horace Greeley in his coat pocket. In just six days in New York, Ellsworth had enlisted and organized an 1,100-man regiment composed mainly of the volunteer firefighters of New York City. The first New York fire zoobs, the flashiest, most boisterous volunteer militia ever to walk down the Washington's Pennsylvania Avenue, would be the proof Ellsworth needed to show that his militia plan would work. With Greeley's help and encouragement, Ellsworth immediately placed ads in newspapers and blanketed the city with posters. Two days after arriving in New York, he awarded officer commissions to New York Fire Company leaders and to members of the U.S. Zouave cadets, several of whom had agreed to help him in his endeavor. Two of the most famous, uh, we became lieutenant colonel, but Noah Farnham and uh, uh, J.A. Krieger, who were heads of the uh, local fire departments in their boroughs in, uh, in New York. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Noah Farnham took over for Ellsworth after his death and refused to lose his title of Lieutenant Colonel, uh, claiming he could never replace their original Colonel, Elmer Ellsworth. After all of this, Ellsworth began recruiting in earnest. A day later, Ellsworth had at least 1,200 men signed up for a tour of duty lasting 90 days. Ellsworth was immediately elected colonel of the regiment, and the former Zouave cadets who were working with Ellsworth began drilling the volunteers. The next two days brought the enlistments up to 2,300 volunteers, enough for two full regiments. The mayor of New York at that point intervened. He limited Ellsworth to only one regiment because to take more would leave New York City severely undermanned as to firefighters. Ellsworth made the decision to recruit New York firefighters based on several good reasons. He knew that firefighters were trained to work together as a single unit, each doing his duty, but keeping an eye on the men around him. They could respond quickly, obey orders, organize, and execute upon command. Elmer Ellsworth believed men with these attributes were make, would make good soldiers. I want the New York firemen. There are no more effective men in the country and none with whom I can do so much. They're sleeping on a volcano at Washington, and I want men who can go into a fight now. 
Of course, at that point, everyone was expecting that the war would consist of no more than one battle. The day arrived when the 11th New York Fire Zouaves, as Ellsworth's men were now known, left the city on board the steamer Baltic, bound for the nation's capital. When the Fire Zouaves lined up on Canal Street, the final ceremonies began. The president of the New York City Fire Department presented the regiment with a large white flag made of silk and bordered with tricolored fringe of red, white, and blue. Hooks, ladders, and other firemen's tools were embroidered in the center of the flag and a fireman's axe topped its staff. President Wickham spoke. When the fire bell rings in the night, the citizen rests securely, for he knows the New York firemen are omnipotent to arrest the progress of destruction. You are now called to quench the flames of rebellion. Our hearts are with you at all times and in every place. And this particular slide shows the original flag on the uh, left side. That was all the flag I had ever seen until um, 1986 when I was lucky enough to go back to uh, First Bull Run and met the uh, men who were portraying the first fire zouaves at the quasi-centennial. And uh, w one of them had uh, sewn, hand-sewn, all by himself, uh, a silk flag uh, representing, of course, the first regiment. Of the, new, of the New York Fire Zouaves. And uh, seeing this flag in, in person, even though it was a replica, was very moving. It was, it was just beautiful and completely different than any of the other flags. And um, it was quite a, a, quite a sight to see, and, and I thought others should see it as well. Ellsworth and his Zouaves sailed off into history. When Ellsworth and his regiment arrived in Washington, there were no completed plans for quartering the large numbers of troops converging on the Capitol, not just the fire zouaves, but all of them. There was trouble enough for all. After all, we have young men um, away from home, many for the first time in a, a city like Washington with uh, wild women and ready whiskey and uh, no adult supervision, really. And uh, they were all squeezed together, be, and uh, everyone knew about the firemen from New York. Um, and the 11th, because of this, got more than their share of publicity and, unfortunately, more than their share of blame. Finally, something happened that put the Zouaves into the headlines for a good reason. At 2 a.m. on May 9th, a small building very close to Willard's Hotel uh, began to burn. Brigadier General Joseph K. Mansfield, commanding the troops in Washington, called for the services of Colonel Ellsworth and his fire zouaves to help put out the blaze. And um, this particular slide, which is easily found anywhere in the Internet, uh, deserves to be looked at uh, a lot more than just the time I'm going to have here. But the experienced zouaves in their roles as veteran New York firefighters fought the blaze for over an hour. They formed pyramids on one another's shoulders to climb the lightning rods, where they suspended a man headfirst from the burning rooftop so that he could reach a hose extended from below and aim it into the upper story windows. The fire was put out. Other than fear and smoke damage, Willard's Hotel was untouched. The Zouaves had redeemed themselves and repaired their somewhat tattered reputation and given the press a good story with, finally, something positive to say about Ellsworth's pet lambs and, of course, about Colonel Ellsworth himself. But the fire Zouaves were in Washington to do more than just entertain and get into the news. The small colonial city of Alexandria is literally just across the Potomac from Washington. Its proximity made it necessary for President Lincoln to declare martial law as soon as the citizens of Virginia voted to ratify the move to secede that was voted for by the Virginia Senate. As soon as the Virginia Senate had voted for secession, however, a Confederate flag was flown above the Marshall House, a boarding house in central Alexandria, at the corner of King and Pitt Streets. James W. Jackson, who lived there with his family, managed this establishment. Jackson was well known in Alexandria for being an ardent state's rightist and a supporter of the Southern war effort. The flag in question was a huge version, 
It's 18 by 24 feet of the first national flag of the Confederacy, the Stars and Bars. President Lincoln's issue with such a prominent display of Southern patriotism was very simple. From his office, using a telescope, he could see the flag. On the night of May 23rd, a full moon hovered in the sky, and beneath its pallid rays, the Federal Army readied itself to occupy Alexandria. The city had already been warned that its proximity to the Federal Capitol would compromise its freedoms, but uh, for the promises that had been made to provide hospitals in Alexandria and to never fire on Alexandria, they had agreed to this move. Just before 2 a.m., Ellsworth Zouaves marched double quick down to the Potomac's edge. The James Gray and the Baltimore and the Mount Vernon were in the middle of the river. The Zouaves were carried out to them in rowboats. Once aboard, the great paddles began to move the ships down the river. Ellsworth's men were part of the amphibious landing, while the infantry marched across the bridges at Washington and Georgetown. And the cavalry horses quietly made their way across the chain bridge, bringing their riders. About 5 a.m., the Zouaves disembarked, and Ellsworth chose a small group of men to accompany him to the center of town to cut the telegraph wires, leaving the rest of the men under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Noah Farnham. The group turned and began to jog up Cameron Street, where they rounded the corner, trotting the additional block left along Pitt to King Street. There, Ellsworth stopped. The facade of the three-story Marshall House was just to their right, and flying on top of that old boarding house was James Jackson's Confederate flag, complete with a new star, sewn right in the center of seven other stars. At that point, maybe... All the memories of Lincoln's complaining about the flag came to Ellsworth in a flash. Well, yes, a Union flag was now flying from the town flagpole, but the rebel banner that had so taunted Lincoln for weeks was in the sky as well. On impulse, perhaps due to his friendship with Lincoln or youthful pride, no one knew exactly, Ellsworth stopped. And according to memoirs, Ellsworth said, boys, we must have that flag. Ellsworth entered the Marshall House with seven men. Just beyond the door, a sleepy, half-dressed man came to meet the group. Ellsworth demanded to know who put up the flag, but the disheveled man shook his head, claiming he was only a boarder. He had no idea. Colonel Ellsworth then posted a corporal to guard the front door. As the group started the climb to the roof of the boarding house, he posted another corporal on the first floor and a third at the foot of the stairs. The rest of the group accompanied Ellsworth up the rest of the stairs to the top floor. The group approached the ladder to the trap door, which opened onto the rooftop. Revolver in hand, Colonel Ellsworth climbed the short ladder and pushed it open. The flagstaff was to their right, and the men approached it quickly. Ellsworth borrowed a buoy knife to cut the ropes that held the flag aloft, and as soon as the halyards parted, the flag was hauled down and fell into Ellsworth's arms. Ellsworth turned and started back down the trap door, pulling the enormous flag behind him. After descending 12 steps, Ellsworth turned the corner at the landing between the third and second stories. A man wearing pants and a nightshirt stepped from the shadows. Ignoring Corporal Francis Brownell, the young soldier still with Ellsworth's group, he leveled a double barrel shotgun directly at Colonel Ellsworth, who stood just above Brownell uh, on the steps. Brownell tried to turn the shotgun with his bayonet, but the shooter held steady aim and discharged one barrel straight into Ellsworth's chest. Ellsworth pitched forward instantly, pulling the fag flag fabric taut as he fell. As the man twisted to unload the other barrel into Brownell, the corporal successfully knocked the gun aside. And the shot harmlessly discharged into the paneling above the landing. In the precious seconds of silence before this insane reality of what had happened overwhelmed everyone, two men lay dead. Their mingled blood, north and south, soaked into the floorboards and stained the crumpled flag with gore. 
Ellsworth's death made headlines all over the North. The Lincolns, Mary and Abraham, claimed his body at the Washington Naval Yard. The young man lay in state in the East Room of the White House, the first non-president to do so, and his funeral train left the Capitol for New York City, where it lay in state again, mourned by the entire city. A funeral barge then brought his remains up the Hudson and home to Mechanicville to his parents and to Hudson View Cemetery, his final resting place. All this time he was accompanied by Francis Brownell, the man who killed the man who killed Ellsworth. In 1861, the North mourned their martyr. Envelopes and music bore his image. His image and uniform became bits of memento mori. So did bits of the blood-stained flag. Ellsworth's friend John Hay wrote a eulogy that brought tears to all who read it. And President Lincoln sent a letter to Ellsworth's parents, which is considered one of his finest efforts. It's a picture of Ellsworth's dress uniform. And please note the hole that's uh, right near the heart. This was a, I include this because uh, there was a moving moment for me. These, uh, this iconic kepi is at Fort Ward in Alexandria. And I'd seen so many pictures, photographs and paintings of Ellsworth uh, with the kepi on top of his head. But when I, when I finally saw the real thing, I, uh, I must confess, I had a moment. John Hay's obituary to his friends, he always seemed like a paladin or a cavalier of the dead days of romance and beauty. This is a picture of Ellsworth's grave. And the quote is from a letter that he wrote to his parents. The night of his death, he wrote two letters and put them in his coat pocket. One was to his fiance and one was to his parents. And in both of them, he uh, actually sort of predicts his own death, saying that he feels that he may be called upon to make uh, a sacrifice uh, that night. And he who noteth even the fall of a sparrow will have some purpose, even in the fate of one like me. These are pictures of the sesquicentennial wreaths for Ellsworth. And um, uh, as you can see, there were many, apparently, according to people who were at the sesquicentennial, it was quite an event. Well, Elmer Ellsworth is now known for being, only for being, the first officer to die in the Civil War. His blood was among the first to be shed in what came to be a deluge, touching in some manner almost every family in America, telegrams and letters announcing the deaths of others, North and South, would become all too common. Although to a single family, only the death affecting them was mourned. But for Ellsworth, the national family eventually mourned the loss of more than 750,000 men. But remember, when we lost Ellsworth, it was still early in 1861. And for those of you who are interested in learning more about Colonel Elmer Ellsworth and his uh, very close relationship to President Lincoln and, uh, and the Lincoln family and his um, very detailed plans for creating state militias, which are very similar to what we now know as the National Guard, you can purchase this book from Savas Beatty at 20% off. And the coupon code you use is virtual. Um, thank you very much.